This morning I'd like to pick up where we left off in our evangelism methods or evangelistic methods uh, curriculum, course, whatever you want to call it. We welcome some guests today from uh, east of Dallas. Um, again, state your names for the folks here. Okay, great to have you here. Uh, their son's in uh, the AIM program. Uh, any other guests? Good to have you all here. Good to have you folks back, back there with us today. We've been talking about, obviously, as the name of the course would indicate, methods of going out and sharing our faith with others. That's what evangelism is. My definition of evangelism, telling people that you already know what you already know about Jesus. Uh, you might want to remember that, uh, not just for the sake of the final that's coming up, uh, but also just to remind you how simple. Doesn't that sound very simple? Telling people that you already know what you already know about Jesus. If you only know a little bit, go and share a little bit. But the one thing that I wanted all of you to be assured of is you already know more than, and especially the people of this class, you already know more than probably 95% of the people that you will ever meet about what Jesus has done and what it means to be a messenger of good news. Uh, so you have, you have nothing to fear. Truth, understanding the truth about Jesus, it doesn't have to be afraid of false teaching or of ignorance or of anything else. Uh, but God has allowed us to be uh, somehow... Um, vulnerable to Satan's false fears. I don't know why God would allow us to be so susceptible, but our human nature is that it's natural for us to, uh, to be afraid of getting outside of our comfort zone and telling what we already know about Jesus in such a way that we, uh, well, it's, it's just so much a part of us, it's right at the very core of our being, you in, using Jeremiah's term from Jeremiah chapter 20, beginning with verse 7, he said there's a, there's a fire in his heart. It's burning in his bones. I call that holy heartburn. Um, we can't keep it in. It's, it's like the grandparents can't keep the pictures of the grandchildren in the wallet. You know, they've got to be sharing those things because it's, it's so important to them. It's what brings joy to them. Those children are something that they just... Uh, somehow find some way to bring it up in just about any conversation. And, uh, and so that's, it's that way with us, about Jesus, that he brings such joy and peace to us. It's so much of, of, of a part of who we are. It's the, at the very core of our, of our purpose for life, uh, for existing on planet Earth. From the time that we're raised with him from the watery grave of baptism, we live for a whole new reason. And it's to be his ambassadors, to be fishers of men. I could go on and on. To be the aroma of Christ, to, uh, to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth. Uh, to, to All of these things, all of these analogies that are used in Scripture to say, here's who you are. And if we're not going to be that way, as we go out from here to encourage, I don't think inspire is a, wrong, is a bad term, to go out and inspire others. Uh, to let them see the, the courage and the zeal and the fire that's within us to go out and to help fan into flame the, the blaze in others, that the Lord's church can have a, a, a lasting impact and a real purpose in the communities in which they exist. And they're seeking for ways to work into other people's lives through acts of service, um, random acts of kindness, uh, doing things and being things and saying things just for the purpose of getting the conversation started and then in the midst of the conversation not being afraid to ask for the Bible study, knowing where you want to go with that study. So I, I think it, it sure fits the term as far as I'm concerned, methods of evangelism. Questions about that basic purpose teaching what we already know 
about Jesus to people we already know. You put it either way, or going to people that we already know and telling them what we already know about Jesus. That's, a, that's the whole uh, simple, simple, very simplistic, really, uh, way of explaining what evangelism is or who we are as heralds of good news. Thoughts about that, questions about that before we move on. Well, the method includes uh, not just ways to get the conversation started, as Jesus did with a woman at the well, by way of review, we've covered that. Uh, getting the conversation started and then bringing up spiritual things in the midst of that conversation. But then realizing that what we're really looking for is an opportunity to sit down with them. They having their own copy of God's word helping them to find answers to their questions in God's word, bringing them from where they are to where God wants them to be. But with the attitude of two truth seekers on a journey together. Now that's quite a bit different than the concept of, hey, look, I've got it right, you have it wrong, I'm here to get you straightened out. If you'll just listen to me and stick with me, I'll get you on the right track. Now, that might have worked back during the debate age. I don't know that it did. I know that some debates were won. I'm not sure how many souls were won. But I believe in the 21st century, especially with the mentality that people have, first they want to see how much you care. And then they're going to care how much you know when you come alongside as a truth seeker, asking them to help you as you help them and learn about Jesus together and grow into a, into a common understanding of what the truth of the matter is. Now, the truth of the matter is that you're probably going to know more than they already know because you're here. You haven't been here and haven't spent much time in God's Word and preparing yourself. But that's all right. You're still on the same path. You might be a little farther down the path than they are. And so you want to help them along uh, as a truth seeker thinking of them as a true seeker until they prove otherwise. Uh, that's going to do a couple of things. Number one, it's going to keep you away from being in an argumentative mood or mode. It's going to keep the study from turning into an argument about where differences are and arguing those things. It's going to turn into a, a couple of people that both respect the fact that Jesus is the Son of God and the Bible is the Word of God Let's search together and see what he says. And when you come to places of differences, and you will, you appreciate the common ground on which you stand, but you then go to the word to try to understand that truth alike. As I travel across the country doing these evangelism workshops, I see more and more even the division that's within our own brotherhood, let alone the, the division that exists many very high walls that exist between us and other people who recognize that Jesus is the Son of God and the Bible is the Word of God. And I find this to be true. I, I was going to make this point in chapel this morning. I probably, you might see it again Monday. I'm speaking in chapel Monday. But let's let this area right here represent truth. Not as, not as you understand it, or as I understand it, or as some religious people understand it who are in drastic difference in some opinions about some very important things. But I'm not talking about that truth. I'm talking about not the truth as we understand it. I'm talking about the truth as God intended it. I'm talking about the truth. As Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by him. I'm talking about that truth. And as I travel across the country and even see some drastic differences and divisions within our own fellowship, I see that over here to the left are some people that are willing to be very liberal. I'll put lib there, all right, in their understanding of the truth. And I, at the same time, find some people that are extremely like the Pharisees, very legalistic in their understanding of truth. You know what I'm talking about, Tim. And uh, I, I find this to be a real problem for us to be an answer to Jesus' prayer about our oneness. As he prayed for 
the body of Christ to be one body. Paul thought it was important enough to mention it several times, especially in Ephesians chapter 4. And yet our quest is to be truth seekers together. I'll talk more about this as time goes on. But this is what I believe we're in quest of, is a common understanding of truth. It's extremely important. You'll hear more about this. I don't want to get off on this right now because I want us to continue to talk about methods to evangelize. But he says in his prayer in John chapter 17, beginning with verse 20 and going through verse 23, it's by our oneness and our common effort to be on a quest for understanding and the teaching of the truth, leaving our opinions and our traditions and our comfort zones and everything out of the picture, but in our common quest for truth and our common effort to evangelize the world with the truth as God intended it. It's by that that the world will know who we are. The world will know that you have sent me. That's what Jesus said. And we're going to get back to that. I don't want to get off on that right now. But I want to talk about the method, our approach, as we go out into the world as seekers of truth, and look for other seekers of truth without loosening things that he has not loosed and without binding things that he has not bound. Though that's, that's twice he mentioned it. In Matthew chapter 16 and Matthew chapter 18, he mentioned it twice. I think that certainly gives a reason for us to show some special attention to the fact of not being legalistic or liberal, but being truth seekers as he intended it. Well, for not wanting to get on that, I sure spent enough time on it. Let's go back to the idea of methods for sharing it. Yes, sir. Okay. I think that's a great question. He wants to know, wh- where do you start? Do you, do you start by memorizing the material? And, or, or what do you do? I, I really don't want you to, to spend much time in, in taking this out on the study with you. What is that when you walk in with this? Here, here let's, let's study the Word, and you walk in like this, and, and then, let's see, let's open up your... What are we doing? Pardon? We're... We're studying man-written stuff. Men that are no more knowledgeable than you are. Oh, it's got my name. It has my name on it. Oh, <laughs> ah, that's just as true. It's just as susceptible to being man's idea, Jerry Tallman's idea. That's not what you want to do. All we're talking about is a method. The message is right here. But what hasn't he given us here? He hasn't given us a particular method other than to go out and do it like Jesus would. And that would be speaking the truth in love. And what kinds of people did he go to? Well, he went to sinners, didn't he? And not being afraid to go ahead and approach sinners with a loving approach and an acts of service and kindness. Okay, so the method is up to us. But this message, what do we do? Kind of memorize this? Well, I think there's a couple of ways you can do it. One would be, obviously, to form a chain reference. I think that Tim suggested that, to, to go ahead and chain reference some verses. Uh, that's just a method, but you're obviously going to be studying right out of the, the Word and going from one verse to the next to the next. That would be a way. Um, memorizing at least the direction you want to go. Remember when we did the overview of the Bible as a good place to start. Don't, you don't have to do an overview of the Bible just as I did. That's just the things that I emphasize when I do an overview of the Bible. But the main emphasis has to be God loves you enough that he has an eternal plan and there's a place for you in his plan. Here's what the plan looks like. Here's what the word from cover to cover teaches. Tell that story. You know the story. You don't have to use the same words or necessarily even the same characters, but The same thing's true. He uses people of faith to get his task done. He always has. I happen to use Noah and Abraham and Moses and the prophets. 
Those were people of faith in the Old Testament. He used the Apostle Paul. He used, he used the, the Apostles in the New Testament to begin that spread of the gospel across the Roman Empire in one generation. We're going to take a closer look at that today in the book of Acts. But the method is being a truth seeker yourself, pulling up alongside of other truth seekers, helping them to find answers to their questions in God's word, and helping to lead them in an understanding that will bring them into the kingdom of God. Method, how do you get that done? You can memorize the passages, maybe make a chain reference. But do it with some of your classmates. Do it with some members of your family the first couple of times. Hear yourself, see yourself doing this. And then go out and do it with somebody on your 10 most wanted list. Somebody that you're praying for and asking God. Does that help? At least some places to start. Getting used to doing it. Oh, you might walk in a couple of times with, with this in your hand and say, you know, this is just a, a guide to finding the passages. That's all it is. But close it up and do your reading from here. Have them do the reading. Before you state what you think a verse is saying, ask them what they think it's saying. And then come to a common understanding by comparing your thoughts about what it says, seeking what did God intend for that verse to say. Okay? Other questions or thoughts? Uh, the thing is, I'm still a student. You're still a student. We're all going to continue to be students until we get home and have that great big aha when we get to heaven. All right? Uh, but in the meantime, um, we're not ignorant. We're not uninformed. But neither are they, but maybe they've been informed with certain teachings. And maybe there's been some teachings other than exactly what the Scripture says, but understandings of what the Scripture says that we've been taught with. And it's good for us to compare, but seek what did God intend when he inspired these things. That's the method I want to get across that I have found over thousands of Bible studies works best toward bringing people to obedience of faith and and I think, I think Ricardo, who went with you on that study? Aha, good experience for you too. Okay, great. Uh, so there, there's certainly those opportunities out there if we don't approach it incorrectly. Yes, ma'am. Okay, we already talked about that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. But, but it was really difficult at first, you know, and it was all about him. She didn't believe that this was essential. And but yet four years later. She four said, years it. later. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I witnessed it myself, and I'm going, so wait a minute. Four years ago, you said it wasn't important. Yeah. You know, what happened? And because I wasn't part of that. Sure. I mean, we, wasn't, we went ahead and studied it, but okay. we talked to that part. But even, you know, what I ended up starting to do was getting people to write down their opinion, because so often. Okay. Let me summarize what she said for the sake of the DVD, okay? Four years passed from the time that she studied with someone that held a particular position. Four years later, as they continued that study, uh, a different position. She had studied herself out of where she was. Could have been because of some seeds that you planted. Folks, be honest with yourself about being in the same place that you were six or eight years ago. And your understanding of some things that you thought were... I, I read some papers that I wrote while I was here at Sunset. And I couldn't even have fellowship with myself. <laughs> because of further study and some growth and some, I hope, drawn closer and closer to what the truth is in the matter. And some of that, because I've studied with someone, a truth seeker, who was in a different place, and I learned some things, and they learned some things, but what are we in quest of? Drawing closer and closer and closer to the truth. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, we, we've looked at about three, well, we've looked at three major lessons. Now, not so much methodology as message, 
But in a sense, it is a method. It's a simple method of, of an overview of the Bible. It happens to be the material in Lesson 2 in, in this uh, collection of material by this guy named Jerry Tolman. Uh, it's just a, what I have found has worked as a good place to start with someone, whether they have doctorates in Bible or whether they've never opened a Bible before. It's good, a good place to start. Start on common ground with that overview. You need to be able to do an overview of the Bible, not just in order to get past the exam in this class, but it's a good place to start. Did you hear what I said? Good. Um, it's a good place to start as you go out and share the gospel with someone. And again, you don't have to do it just the way that I do it. I don't do it exactly the same way every time, but it leaves the same message. God loves you and he wants you to spend eternity with him, so much so that he sent his son to tell you so and to make your way to heaven clear. That's what the Bible is from cover to cover. Do that overview, a summary, so they can see how much God has planned for and loved them since before the foundation of the world and wants them in his kingdom and how he sent his son to pay the price so that they could be. Secondly, the second lesson, lesson four in here. Don't go there until they already are convinced that the Bible is the word of God and that Jesus is the son of God. Now, you might not have asked them specifically, but you can tell by their questions and their response and their respect for the word and talking about Jesus as the son of God. Once they're convinced that the Bible is the word of God and Jesus is the son of God, they need to come to grips with what is their relationship with God. And so lesson four in here is man's sin problem. More specifically, their sin problem and God's solution. And, their God, and God's solution, in one word, Jesus. And so that material in here uh, is extremely important. That's the second lesson not only to get past the exam in this class, but th did you hear that? Okay, but also in order to be able to have a place to go to where the person you're studying with comes to grips with, what is my relationship with this God who loves me? And what part does my faith play in that? And what kind of faith saves exactly at what point does the blood of Jesus wash my sins away? Where does my Faith has to be in order for me to be a recipient of his grace. We studied Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. You might want to know, oh, at least uh, three or four, four or five major passages in that study um, in order to be able to teach somebody and, and pass the final. Okay. <laughs> third study, we'll, third study, third study. We looked at it last time in this class, uh, last Friday, and that was, how do I respond or surrender my life to a God that loves me enough to send his own son to die for me? And we typically, re typically refer to that as the plan of salvation. Faith, what kind of facts are told about Jesus? What am I going to do with those facts? In other words, what's my response going to be? Number one, choose to believe those facts. When I realize that my sins have me separated from them, sorry that I've gone there, a willingness to turn. Repent and be baptized. That's what the people on the day of Pentecost were told when they were cut to the heart with the facts about Jesus. What shall we do? But also from Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, a willingness to not only start by confessing Jesus as Lord with our lips, but let in our whole lives as we continue as a disciple of Jesus, let our whole lives demonstrate he is Lord. He is sitting on the throne. I have surrendered the lordship of my life to Jesus. I no longer will call the shots. I have turned my life over to a new master. It's Jesus. And how do you do that? How do you say, Lord, here's my life. I've made a mess out of it. You wash it clean by the blood of Jesus this thing called my life, and you master it. How do you do that? By surrendering your life and being buried with him in the waters of baptism as a believing, repentant person, confessing and revealing and surrendering the throne of your life to Jesus. Now, we studied that pretty thoroughly two weeks ago. And then I gave you the opportunity with the last hour of class two weeks ago while I went up to 
hype up the campaign coming up to the upper level students. I gave you the opportunity of sitting down and sharing one of those two studies with each other. Any, anybody want to share what that experience uh, did for you or what that was like as you tried to share the message with one another? Anybody want to talk about that? Yes. It didn't go as smoothly as you oh, thought no, it might. No, no, okay, no. all right. You can't just walk into the area. Okay, okay. Now, how how are you going to get smoother at doing that? More practice, more experience in doing it, becoming more familiar with, feeling much more comfortable with the message. So you're not trying to do it the way Jerry does it necessarily, but doing it the way God would have you do it. Okay, smoothly, uh, from your heart, not just from your head. Thanks, John, for sharing that. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Because even though it's a gift of theirs, and God has given that to them, and it may not be my gift, they still had to work at it. Uh -huh. You know? And sure. They, they didn't, like God just didn't say, you're born with this, and when it comes to the time they were like, <coughs> you were able to convert people. Okay. And, like, and for me, I'm like, that intimidates me, you know, in is talking to people like that. And it's not so scary, you know? Okay. Or my mercy level. You know? oh, okay. Great, and I, I just want to reiterate one of the things that she said, a realization about the difference between giftedness. She didn't mention the other part, but even if that doesn't happen to be our particular God-given gift and we kind of are natural at it, even the ones that are natural at sharing what they know about Jesus and having a positive response from others, even those that are gifted or natural at it, they still have to work at it. Secondly, it's not a matter of giftedness, if you'll notice, that isn't listed in the passages that talk about what God has given us as gifts. Instead, it's a responsibility. It's a privilege, yes, but a responsibility that all of us who know enough to be a disciple ought to be able to go and make disciples. Now, if we don't have the natural gift of gab, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, we're, not, we're introverts instead of extroverts, and, and uh, we have a tougher time getting conversations going, and, and we, have a, uh, we have to come over, overcome more natural fears within us to even ask for a Bible study. We have to work at it harder than somebody that just seems to be natural at that. Yeah, you know, they still have to work at it, but that doesn't take away our responsibility. You remember Moses, how he kept throwing excuses up to God, but, 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 but I, 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 I don't know whether he stuttered, I don't know whether he had a lisp, I don't know what his problem was, but he said he was slow of speech. God said, who do you think made your mouth? Ephes uh, Ephesians. Exodus chapter 4, I think it's verse 10. Who made your mouth? Wasn't it I, the Lord? Well, God made you how you are. He still doesn't take away from you the responsibility, even though you might not especially have a, a gift of eloquence. He still gave you a responsibility to share what you know with others. That's the only way that your world's going to be evangelized. Thank you for sharing that. So as you think about experiences you had in doing this before, the more practice, the easier it'll come. Three studies that I want you to be familiar with Maybe more a, method, a message than it is a method, but I think it still comes into a method. An overview of the Bible, an understanding of the sin problem and how God solved it for you and what your response needs to be by faith. And then the plan of salvation as a fuller understanding of what our faith looks like when it's responding to God's love. And as truth seekers, letting them do the reading, ask for their understanding of the passage, you state your understanding of the passage, and one from their background, they begin to state opposition to what they're seeing, especially when you get into the area of baptism. You have to be extremely patient, 
but asking, how do you understand that in light of this passage? And when, the, when, when it says that baptism is an immersion and you were sprinkled, when it says they were believing adults and you, from your experience, were, were an infant when you were sprinkled, help me to understand where the scriptures would teach that. And because you want to understand that from their uh, approach, uh, let them do the struggle and define the passage that would say so. It's not in there. And help them in love to understand that these denominational doctrines can really cause a problem. Or if they were baptized by immersion, sure enough, but it wasn't to have their sins washed away. They believed they were already forgiven. How do you understand that your, that your sins were washed away in a different way than what the scriptures mention? And you were baptized for a different reason that's not found in the Bible. I'm interested in that. Help me to understand that in the scriptures or from scripture. And they'll struggle. And that struggle is good for them because it will help them grow and maybe change the way they understand even if it takes four years. Okay? Yes, sir? The word denomination. Well, I'm telling you, that's a tough word, isn't it? I look at that and, whew, wow, there's a 10. I didn't know I had one in there. There's a single. I have a few more of those. And way back here amongst these moths in here, I even have a 20. Pass it back. I got to watch this. I've got, you, I got to have my eye on you, okay? What are those? They're different denominations. The word denomination literally means to separate or divide according to kind. Now, in the religious world, we would be enabled to define ourselves as non-denominational or even maybe a little stronger, anti, against the idea of dividing up the body of Christ when Jesus prays for us all to be one. But in times past, it seems like it has become more and more our nature, not like the Restoration Fathers, not like Jesus, not like the apostles of the first century, but we have become very divisive in some of our thinking or our methods, holding so strongly to some opinions that we end up denominating ourselves from others, dividing. Now, like Paul said to the Corinthians, uh, when they were dividing over some very important issues, he said, uh, there's some of you that uh, are dividing, and I'm kind of glad so that the truth can be recognized. <laughs> but at the same time, are we a denomination? No, especially when it's the Church of Christ that's talked about in the scriptures with a small c. That's not ever written and described as a denomination. It's the body of Christ. It's the, it's the disciples that call out the gather together. We need to be careful as we talk to others, especially when we come across as if it's a capital C, a title. It's an adjective phrase in the scriptures describing whose we are. And God knows whose are his. And we need to be seeking to bring others to Jesus, not into what they would understand is a particular denomination or a denominational teaching. So it's a little tougher to answer your question than it should be, but uh, no, we're not a denomination. Not if we're teaching and trying to practice what the scriptures say. Okay? Okay, all right. Sure, okay. And, and there, are, there are others that think that they're the only ones going to heaven, and only 144,000 of them, okay, <laughs> uh, from the, that particular group of people. But what are they teaching? 
using a political term, they're teaching the party line, okay? <laughs> they're particular, teaching a particular teaching that they got from the Watchtower Society or from their headquarters, this is what we believe. It's absolutely appalling to me when I get a phone call from a member of the congregation where I'm working with them, uh, hey, Jerry, what do we believe about such and such and so and so? I say, we? What, do you have a mouse in your pocket? You know, <laughs> uh, what do you mean we? Are you asking what does the Bible say on a particular topic or issue? That's what the question really needs to be. Otherwise, we become very denominational in our thinking, in our attitude, and the way that we share that message with others. Okay, we, We're no different than a denomination when we say, here's the Church of Christ's teaching on that. Is it the biblical teaching? Is it what the inspired word of God says? That's where this Church of Christ with a small c. That's what our response needs to be. Or we become, at least in the minds and the hearts and the view of others, we're no different than a denomination that thinks we're the only ones going to heaven. Church of Christ with a small c, as it's described in the scriptures, are the gathered together, those that are on their way to heaven. And instead of cutting people off, Let's draw them in. Other thoughts on that? Kevin? Just a comment on, I like the way you, you said it when somebody calls you and asks you a question of what you're supposed to believe about this. No, what the Bible teaches. But when you say no, the Jehovah's Witness, uh, if they had a question like that, they would call the Watchtower. Yes. The main Watchtower group. This is who we're going to call because they're the authority on what mm-hmm. we believe. Sure. Same thing with the ba- uh, Southern Baptist Convention. Okay. Yes. Very good point. And he just pointed it out for the sake of the DVD. I'm going to try to repeat the main thought, and that is other groups would go to their religious leaders to find out what they believe. We need to go to the scriptures to find out what we believe. Now, we can help each other find the passages. But what we're seeking is what did God intend when he inspired these things? Now, what is the Church of Christ capital C? What's our line on that? Does that, does that make sense that there's a difference there? Yes. Jesus, yeah, what the scriptures say. instance, and thank you for that, the name on the sign, let's go back to that, okay? That looks like, doesn't it? And how do we usually spell it? With a capital C. Even though we put at the bottom, meets here, that it's not the building, it's the people that meet there. But who are those people? It's an adjective phrase describing our relationship to God through what Jesus did, and so we are the body of Christ, the saved, the redeemed, the reconciled, the blood-bought, those made holy, Uh, The way, we're God's family, we're God's church, we're Christ's church, we're the church of Christ, small c. All of those things, we could have a flip chart out there with all those adjective phrases on it, but what would that make us look like to the community? Confused, rather fickle, okay? And so we have selected one of those adjective phrases to describe us and our relationship to God through faith in Christ Jesus, but we need to be very careful how we use it or the attitude with which we go out and teach, or that will be under, misunderstood continually. And what we're trying to do is bring people to Jesus. He will add them to his church. Amen? That was kind of weak. Okay. We need to go out and proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5, 
and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. And when somebody from, for instance, a Catholic background, which has a very strong headquarters, a very strong head of the church that determines teaching, that's another word for doctrine as we discussed in chapel this morning, very strong teaching coming down from a hierarchy, they're so used to that that it's hard for them to imagine each person being able to read and understand for themselves to go to the scriptures and and, and inquire in search of what did God intend when he wrote these, when he inspired these things to be written. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and it's not... I'm not asking you to be baptized into another faith. Okay. Uh, it is being baptized and buried with Christ. Okay, in her mother's view, as she said, her mother doesn't want her to be baptized into another faith. Speaking of other than the Catholic Church, it's not being baptized into another, it's being baptized into Christ Jesus. It's not a matter of a certain denominational view of Christ, it's trying to follow the Scriptures and following the truth. I I was right there for two years in my own personal struggle, okay, because of what my parents would think. It was only after I was baptized, immersed into Christ, two years struggling with it, that I found out that my mom and dad were both baptized by immersion for the forgiveness of their sins uh, when they were teenagers. Uh, They just were following a different teaching, or they were attending the church with a different teaching, and yet not followers of that teaching. Boy, that, that blew me away after I found out what the response was. Corey, uh, Cody? One of the things I consider, it's almost as though all these quote-unquote denominations all have these lines drawn around a field of battle. And then you have Christ standing out there in some spot. And people come out to join their armies. And they say, oh, there's a Catholic church. I've got to go join my army. Some people say, oh, there's a Baptist church. I've got to go join my army. Uh, there's you know, the flag of the Jehovah Witness. I've got to go join my army. And Christ is standing there saying, listen, who's in my army? Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's who's not a denomination. That's, you can join whatever army sure. you want thinking you're fighting sin, but you just be fighting each other. That's right. And, and that's not what he wants. Right. That's not what he wants. Thank you for pointing that out. I don't need to repeat that. He has a microphone on. He's going to read for us uh, here in just a minute. Yes, sir. Good. I had one particular lady that I was studying with that was questioning about baptism because she had never learned that in the particular Baptist church that she went to. She said, I wonder what my pastor would say about this. I said, there's my phone. Why don't you call him? She called and said, I'm over at Jerry Tallman's office over here at the Church of Christ. We're studying about baptism. He said, come right over to my office right now. And so she did. And she had an opportunity to ask him about some particular passages. And here was his response. You know, the Church of Christ, capital C, really hard to refute on this subject because they have so many scriptures to back them up. (laughs) It was at that point that I got a phone call from her using his phone in his office asking, Jerry, if I come over right now, would you baptize me? (laughs) Now, I wanted to get a study with him because his response would say, he knows what the scriptures say. He just needs to leave the teaching of his army, okay, to follow the commanding officer, Jesus Christ. But uh, he never would surrender to that opportunity that I presented to him. Uh, But uh, she did. So it's all a matter of patience, not forgetting who we are, or whose army we're in. And that all this breaking up and dividing up into different troops with a different purpose other than the one Christ has for us is not what God's asked us to do or he's asked us to be. Okay, any other questions about where we've been with those three studies and the attitude with which we approach it, the method of reaching out to study? Anybody? Let's go to where we go next. It happens to be the material that I tried to put together in the next lesson, Lesson 7, okay? Lesson 7.
It's the conversions in the book of Acts. Now, assuming at this point that the person that I have been studying with still has not made up his mind or her, her mind or has made a decision to commit their lives to the Lordship of Jesus, for some reason they are not ready to surrender the throne of their life in the way that God asked them to. And it might be over their opposition to um, that particular teaching for the purpose of baptism as to who really in Scripture of a pattern to be sent, uh, set, who was being baptized? Why were they being baptized? How were they being baptized? When were they being baptized? And so those four simple uh, one-phrase words uh, are good questions to ask. And so I want to go down through the uh, conversions in the book of Acts one at a time and ask those questions. Who, why, when, how? Not necessarily in that order. But I think a study of the conversions in the book of Acts, asking those questions, is very revealing. It does provide for us an understanding that it's repentant believers. Who? Why? For the remission or forgiveness of sins, to have our sins washed away, to have a clear conscience before God. Scriptures would give those reasons as to why. How? The only how in all the scriptures is to be immersed. They went down into the water. We're going to see in one conversion. Uh, when? Immediately upon their repentance and belief. Or belief and repentance. So those are going to be the answers and the conclusion, but I want you to think about as we go down through this, very quickly, we're going to pass through these, these particular um, records of history of what happened when people heard the truth about Jesus. When somebody went and shared the good news message as heralds of good news. Evangelists. People just like you and me. Men and women. We're going to see in the scriptures as Apollos uh, had to be taught more accurately the way by Aquila and Priscilla. Let's go through the historical record. First we're going to turn to Acts chapter 2 where we left off last time, last week as we studied. Now I asked Cody if he would to put the mic on because I want him to do the reading just so that the, C the uh, DVD picks up the reading of these passages without having to uh, have me wear out my voice in doing this. So Cody, if you would, give me a rest here by reading Acts chapter 2 beginning with verse 22. I'll encourage you to skip down just a little bit. Um, as we read along. Would you go ahead and start reading Acts 2 and verse 22 like we did last time in class? People of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus from Nazareth, of Nazareth was a very special man. God clearly showed this to you by the miracles, the wonders, the signs that he did through Jesus. You all know this because it happened right here among you. Jesus was given to you, and with the help of those who don't know the law, you put him to death by nailing him to a cross. But this was God's plan, which he had made long ago, he knew that this would happen. God raised Jesus from the dead and set him free from the pain of death because death could not hold him. For go, David, to, go to verse 32 and pick up that thought again as he repeats that very thought. So Jesus is the one whom God raised from the dead. And we are all witnesses to this. Jesus was lifted up to heaven and is now at God's right side. Okay, go down to verse 36 as he begins to kind of summarize all of this as to who Jesus is and who, who made him that way. So all the, peop uh, so all the people would know... Uh, so all the people of Israel should, truly, should know this truly. God has made Jesus, the man you nailed to the cross, both Lord and Christ. Okay, so he kind of summarizes these thoughts. Here's who Jesus is. He is who he claimed to be. He is the Son of God. It was proven by the miracles he worked in your midst. And even with that evidence, you nailed him to the cross. And God raised him up. In so doing, he has made him both Lord and Christ. And your sins put him there and mine. As I'm studying with somebody after they've read that, I want them to see that summary. Anything there you disagree with? Any of you? If I were, if I were studying with you, would you disagree with any of those facts coming from that passage? The evidence is overwhelming. He is both Lord and Christ. The evidence of his miracles 
even in the midst of all that evidence, you nailed him to the cross. God raised him up. The gospel message, the death and resurrection of Jesus and who he is, Son of God, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Christ and Lord. What was their response? Verse 37, when they heard this. When the people heard this, they felt guilty and asked the uh, they asked Peter and the other apostles, what shall we do? Okay, they felt guilty. Would that lead you to believe that they believed what they heard? Okay, it doesn't say, oh, they believed what they heard, but their response would say, some translations use the word, they were cut to the heart. They were convicted. And when they asked, what shall we do? What was the message that Peter gave them, inspired by the Holy Spirit? Peter said to them, change your hearts and lives and be baptized, each one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What did he tell them was the reason for them to be baptized? What would happen? Forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins and? And you'll receive the Holy Spirit. And to receive the Holy Spirit. They would receive the Holy Spirit. In verse 41, it tells what their response was and what God did. Then those... People who accepted what Peter said were baptized. About 3,000 people were added to the number of believers that day. Okay, and then down to verse 47, he says again what the Lord did as they responded that way. What the people did. Verse 47. They praised God and were, uh, and were liked by the people. Uh, every day the Lord added those who were being saved to the group of believers. Okay, and so they rejoiced over their salvation, and people liked what they saw as other people observed them. But what did the Lord do? He added to their number daily those that were being saved. And so, what could we learn from this passage? Anybody? Who was being baptized? Pardon? Those that had been lost, but where are they now? Once they, pardon? They were believers. And, uh, that's the who, uh, the when. Immediately, the same day that they became convinced as to who Jesus is and what he had done and what God did by raising him from the dead. Immediately. Now the word that would answer the how is the word baptizo. They were immersed. That's what the word means. That's the only thing it means. That's all it ever meant. The who, the how, the when, why? Verse 38. Why were they baptized? For the forgiveness of sins. And that God might take up his dwelling place, his spirit might come and dwell in them. And that they could be added to the family or the number of people that were being saved. Three things, all of which God did. Now, what response might you get from someone of a different understanding, a different background? What, what responses might you get here that you need to be able to respond to again from Scripture? Pardon? This is a work. Okay, it's a work. Well, whose work? Now, if you're not ready to answer from Scripture uh, as to why you know it's God's work, this Scripture certainly says so. He's the one forgiving sin. He's the one that's adding his spirit to your life, or putting his spirit in your life. He's the one that's adding you to the number of saved. The Lord added. It's the Lord's work. But another passage, if you're not ready to answer it, write the question down. Go find the passages. But Colossians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13, an excellent passage to go to, as another place that would reiterate whose work is being done. Of course, that depends on which translation you're reading from but it either says that it's God's doing or it's God's work. But read Colossians chapter 2, and since, Cody, you have the mic on, I'm going to ask you from that, what is that, New English version? Is that what that is? Century version. Sen New century version. Read Colossians chapter 2. If we don't like the translation or the way it's worded, we'll ask for another one. But let's, since you have the mic on, you read first. Chapter 2, verse. I'm not familiar enough with that passage uh, in that translation in order to quote it, so go ahead. When you were baptized, you were buried with Christ, and you were raised up with him through your faith in God's power that was shown when he raised Christ from the dead. Okay, that translation says God's power. 
What did God's power do? He forgave our sin. Okay, keep reading the next verse. <clears throat> when you were spiritually dead because of your sins and because you were not free from the power of your sinful self, God made you alive with Christ. Okay, he made you alive. He's the one that gives you life. It was by his power. And other translations say it was by the working of God or God's work. It's not the work that you're doing in the baptistry. It's the work that he's doing. It's your surrender. So this teaching that's out there, that baptism is a work and we aren't saved by our works, is strictly a man-made theory or theology. It's not from Scripture. The Scripture says that baptism isn't a work that we do. Baptism is a response and a surrender on our part. It's the work that God does. Belief takes more effort on our part. If anything out of that thoughts about our response is a work, it's our believing. That takes more effort to to gather the facts and digest the facts and choose to believe the facts. Yes? Along those same lines, baptism is always something that's passive. It's done to you. Okay. Physically by someone else. Okay. It's a spiritual work that is done. And so often the, the mode of accepting by faith that the denominationalist would propose is pray the sinner's prayer. Yes. Well, isn't that doing something? And that's something that I do. Mm -hmm. Definitely not something. Okay, and so the sinner's prayer would be more work on our part, more effort on our part. That's us doing something in order to be saved. That's more a work than baptism, which is totally, you use the word, a passive surrender on our part. But it's also out of our trusting. Boy, you could go and teach all kinds of things about people who did things because God said so. You can go to the building of the ark with Noah. You can go to Naaman, dipping seven times in the River Jordan. Well, that, no, it was Naaman that told... No, it was Naaman. Naaman. Had a brain burp there for a minute. Kind of slip, slip, Kyle. Yes, sir? Uh, on that passage, that word, the work of God, mm -hmm. that word is used a Yes. What does the Greek mean? Thank you. It isn't that he's a Greek scholar. I want you to know that. He just has a good program on his computer. I, I know a little Greek. He owns a restaurant right downtown. I go down there and eat on occasion. But there's nothing wrong with being able to make reference to what does the original word mean? And they'll go to baptism, and they'll be shocked, some people will, if they go to find out what the original meaning of the word is. Now, you'll find out that there are people out there that don't want to talk about baptism, but they want to talk about ace, E-I-S, in the English script of the Greek word, ace, for, baptized for, and they'll go to a, an obscure, occasional translation of the word ace, which means because of. Oh, they'll bring it right over to Acts chapter 2. Do a little more study and find out that ace never in the Greek was translated because of in the presence of an active verb. And so it's impossible to say baptized because of the forgiveness of your sins. My sins were forgiven over here, and because they were, I want to be baptized. Don't let somebody take you down that road. It's just not true. It's not a true understanding of the original language. And don't be afraid to go there. At the same time, don't try to impress them with how much Greek you know. Yes, sir. Oh, don't do that at an auction. You just bought something. Okay. <laughs> Cody. One of the things worth mentioning, too, I think, is Bibles in general. I mean, we've got to put a little bit of faith in that there are some scholarly people that did some of the translation of the Bible. I'm okay. not saying put all your faith in that, but... Okay. If you can't find any translation that translates for to because... Yeah, and there isn't an English translation out there that translates right. Acts 2.38 as because of. Then you've got to ask yourself, why? Yeah, why? Because the scholars recognize that that's not how ace is translated anywhere. According to Keith, we have less than a minute left. Yes, sir. But on the four, just to, I guess, uh, I've uh, heard the preachers use the English meaning... If you are going to jail for stealing chickens, it's not because you are going to steal chickens. It's because because you, you already did. Yeah. They just use that. Yeah, in the English, that works. Okay. Uh, 
But in the Greek, they never translated for. Okay, okay. all right. 